Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we start with a new topic, with linear regression, which is like a, something very basic, which you might know from statistics or from other things, but it's also very basic in machine learning. Since, as you might already could guess, machine learning has a lot to do with probabilities and with statistics. So basically, it's machine learning is, a, is, is now computer scientists doing statistics in a way, okay? But we're doing it slightly differently. In computer science, we don't care so much for like proofs and stuff like that. So we are a bit more sloppy with these things and we try to solve interesting problems no matter whether we understand the theory or not. Okay, so that's like a simple summary of a, a course description of machine learning. But before we get to linear regression, I want to show you one notebook um, which is um, about an example that we had last time. You might remember this difficult transformation example where we changed the parameter of a beta distribution which was between 0 and 1 and we changed it with these very weird transformation logarithm pi divided by 1 minus pi and um, the, the point of all this was to show that the map estimate depends on the way how I'm parameterizing my distribution which is something that you actually don't want right it should be independent of the parameterization and uh, I derived, maybe did I derive this logarithm of a divided by b? I computed that one on the right hand side and then for the left hand side I've showed you on the next slide it's the difference of the digamma functions. Okay, and I just want to show you now how I would now check this, okay, with code. Yeah, because I didn't derive it. I also copied it somewhere from some mass uh, stack exchange or something and um, got the formulas and then I looked up the digamma function and okay it's a derivative of the logarithm of the gamma function. I just just copied it from other people. But now how can I be sure that this thing is really the mean that I want to calculate, okay? And I'm a computer scientist, how do I do this? I write a little computer program and put some random numbers in and if the digamma function calculates the correct thing then everything is fine and I'm happy, okay? so. Always the other coin of this mathematics that we are deriving here to understand like connections and to understand the basics, the other side is always to write little computer programs to check what we proved, okay? So that's like very good because I couldn't tell you much about the digamma function, right? So I just accept it and if it's in a library I can use it. Okay, so let me show you some code where I did this check. So it's a 0a transformation of variable example and that is exactly the example that we've seen. So we have this mapping from pi to x, yeah? So it's logarithm of pi divided by 1 minus pi. So that is my mapping which maps the interval between 0 and 1 to minus infinity and plus infinity. And I also have the inverse mapping. So that is basically pi of x. It's the other way around, okay? Just as we had it. Now, suppose I'm sampling from a beta distribution with some given parameters a and b, um, in this case 100,000 samples, and I call them pi, yeah? so this is like having a random variable, but now containing a long vector of samples, I can generate an x just by applying my function little x to it, okay? So this is quite close to how we wrote things down on our slides. And then I can just calculate the means, and the means are not the same. Okay, so the means d disagree. Uh, I can also run it again. So let's see whether this is still true. Yes, it is still true. So the means differ. I can also put other numbers in here to see whether it's always different. Yeah, it's, it is slightly different, okay? So um, now let's check whether the digamma function is calculating the correct mean, okay? so. So to see that, I found somewhere here on Stack Exchange this formula with the digamma function. And where do I get it? The digamma function can be imported from scipy.special. Yeah? Someone implemented it. However, I don't care how they did it. So they know what they're doing. It's the digamma function. And so now I can compare digamma of A minus digamma of B. And I compare it with the, the empirical mean that I have. And here you see that they nicely agree. Okay. So that is a check that you can do as a computer scientist. And as a mathematician, I would also do it, right? I mean, if my math is typically wrong, right? I typically have mistakes on my slides. 
if not enough students have looked over it, or when I do calculations or derivations, there could be mistakes. So it's always good to check it with the computer, these things. Okay, so that was just the demo for that one. Any questions about that one? And it looks like something super simple comparing two means, right? But it's very, um, could be very useful to do it with the computer here. Okay, so far so good. Um, let's see what we will see today is linear regression. And ideally, we also have a look at the code. Yeah, but we, before we look at the code and the nice plots here, yeah, we will, um, oh, they are slightly broken. Uh, we will repair them later. Um, let's first go through the mass. So let's start with our section on linear regression. Okay, so overview. We will talk about regression, what it is. Okay, then we talk about linear regression, how to estimate the parameters for linear regression using maximum likelihood estimation. And next, we will do the so-called rich regression, which is a different form of regression. Now, in our lingo, it is just the map estimation. So rich regression equals map estimation. And you all know what this means. We have a prior for the parameter. We do Bayesian inference. And then the map estimate will be the so-called rich regression, which is some famous form. And then there's also the fully Bayesian linear regression, where we are not getting a point estimate, but the output will be a posterior distribution over the parameter, OK? And finally, I discussed some alternative ways to do regression as well. And um, the material from this lecture is mostly from chapter 7 of Kevin Murphy's textbook um, called Machine Learning a Probabilistic Perspective. There's an old version of the book, and there are now two new books which are replacing the old one. And they are all available for free online, so you can download the PDF um, completely legally. Um, however, as time goes by, my lecture diverges a little bit from Kevin Murphy. So the starting point was his chapter, and now it's something else, maybe. So let's see. OK, first the setup. So in regression, we are given some data points, yeah, given as pairs, for example, where the xi are viewed as locations. They could be vectors as well. Sometimes they are just scalars. And the y are some function values. They are typically scalars, OK? And our goal is now to find a function f that maps location onto values. Um, we can also draw a picture for that one on the board. So let's do that. So basically, um, the data, a single data point, is a single point here on the board, OK? And so that one tells me that for the x value of 1, my y will have the number 2. OK, interesting. Then I have more examples. Maybe all these. So those are now measurements for different x. I get different y's. And typically, now I'm looking for a function f, such that f of x um, is approximately my y. OK, and typically we number them. So this one is x1, y1, OK and so on and so forth until xn, yn. So we would, we would like to have find a function f such that if I apply to the input, I will get the output. OK, so this is really machine learning, very basic machine learning question here. And that is the so-called regression problem. And of course, looking at the data, yeah, our brain can do regression. And it sees that somehow there looks like there's some function. So it looks like the data point get larger if I'm always getting larger and also slightly over there. So maybe this is the true underlying function. Okay, so I can put it through the data point. Yeah, so that is the regression problem. And today we will look at linear regression, which is one particular form of finding such a function. Yeah, now you might think of linear regression. OK, probably now we are looking for a linear function which is fitting nicely through the data point. However, that is a misconception. Linear regression doesn't mean that we are only looking for linear function, but that the parameterization is linear. So that basically the function f is somehow parameterized by some parameters w, and the function f is linear in the parameter. Then it is linear regression. It could be nonlinear in x. I will say this sentence 10 times during this lecture. Okay, so linear regression is linear because it's linear in the parameters, Nece not necessarily in the data points. Okay, 
However, often when you talk to other people, people believe that this is linear regression, okay? And they are kind of right, but our more general point of view, linear regression is that it's linear in the parameters. For example, if you look at the Wikipedia page on linear regression, typically people are talking about these straight lines that you draw through data. But linear regression is a bit more general. Okay, now I said also that the x could be vectors, yeah? So that's just on the board, my x are usually scalars because I can nicely draw them here in two dimensions. But in principle, the x could have many entries, so it could be like a whole vector space. So I could have like a, um, yeah, can I draw it? No, maybe not. Uh, I can try to draw it and fail. So I have a 2D space, right? And there are some, yet another axis, and this, this will be the axis y. And that will be the first component. And now I'm having notation problems, but let's say and this is the second component. And in principle, now I have these some little axes over here. And to give them some 3D effect, let me draw them something like this. So you could imagine they are like they are like like little plants growing here on a lawn, right? And they have different heights in the z-axis or in the y-axis. And now my solution here is not a line or something that I draw through it, but more like something like a surface. Yeah, something, some, some surface that I fit through my data, okay? So the output again is a scalar, but the input could be scalar or it could be also a whole vector, okay? And... Um, yeah, more general, the input in principle could be anything. So the, the x vector could be an image or it could be a whole matrix or something. So it could be really high dimensional. It doesn't matter for our, um, for our presentation here. So why is that a useful application? So here are a couple of interesting applications. So the most famous one were to predict celestial orbits, okay, as done by the 24-year-old Gauss. Yeah, there was some... Um, Ceres, I think, is it a moon or something of some of, of our other planets? Jupiter. Of Jupiter, okay. Ceres is a, is a one, one moon of Jupiter and so if you were 24 years old and lived in the time of Gauss, you would do astronomy, okay? So today people want to do, everyone wants to do deep learning. At that time everybody wanted to do astronomy. Why? Because like in the beginning of the 19th century, like people were developing new telescopes. So that was like the super high tech, so the super advanced technology. And this was giving you now a new way onto reality. So you could see these little dots near the planets. That was really surprising that you can see them with your own eye. And so that looks like there's, there's little systems around the planets. That's very different from what people thought before, like in the heliocentric or the geocentric um, point of view for astronomy. So they were learning all these things and that was like the hot topic. And so if you were a mathematician, yeah, and you were very theoretical, then you thought, oh, let's see, I want to get a position at university, I should do some applied stuff, okay? And so the applied stuff was astronomy. And you were calculating basically the orbits. Okay, and how did Gauss do it? Basically by inventing linear regression, okay? So you had a couple of measurements, uh, let's say yesterday night you had a certain location for this moon at a certain time and then the day before you had another location of this moon and you're trying to predict the next location, okay? And this can be done with linear regression, for example. I will show you the paper, maybe. Will I show you? Yeah, let's, I, I will show you some, some book from Gauss where we see some formulas. Um, other things you could do is interpolate measurements. For example, you have some stations where you measure the temperature, like in Dortmund and in Cologne. Now, what is the temperature in between? Yeah? So basically, you can um, interpolate between different stations. So let's say this is now 1D world, and this is Dortmund, and this is Köln. We have a, some temperature measurement here, and we have some temperature measurement over there. Yeah? So why not draw a straight line between them and then we know everything that's going on in between, okay? So we could, trying to learn the function, maybe here's also Münster, and um, I don't know, we can learn a function and that will tell us the temperature everywhere, even though that we only have discreetly many stations, okay? 
So that's an, a useful thing. Another thing is smooth some noisy measurements in spectroscopy, for example. So in spectroscopy, um, you're getting some, some weird shaped curve like that. Oh, it's not a curve. Actually, those are all measurements all over the place. This is increasing frequency. And kind of you want to, uh, what, is here the, what is here the law behind? OK, so you want to smooth that one. OK, you want to learn a function through this noisy measurement. Why is it noisy? Because you bought a cheap spectrosco uh, spectroscopy instrument, whatever it's called, spectrometer probably. Yeah? You bought a cheap one, and the cheap one has a very large error. But you say, OK, I spent more time, I made more measurements, and then I'm doing linear regression to find the right function through it. Um, what else? Yes, predict the future. Yeah, that's always interesting. Uh, let's say you're measuring the, the CO2 level um, for a couple of centuries. OK, and so you see something like this. And now the question is, how does it go on? OK? And there are many possibilities, right? I mean, it could go on like this. It could go on like that. It could go on like that. So basically, we have measurements up to a certain point. And as I said, interpolation is finding a value between data points. But extrapolation is um, learning something about where we don't have data points. Question? Oh, oh yes. Oh, yeah, very bad. OK, maybe you haven't seen anything of this now in the video. OK, sorry about this. So let me just quickly repeat what we are talking about. Did we still record that one? So that was like the 2D regression thing. Ideally, we have that one. That was the one about temperature between Münster, Dortmund, and Cologne. We have some finite station, and we want to interpolate between them. So interpolate measuring in between or estimating something in between. That was the smoothing example from my spectrometer, which is very noisy. And that is the CO2 thing and extrapolating it into the future, so where there's no data. Okay? So learning the function be behind this, behind my measurements, is, is like uh, some, something very scientific, right? We want to learn the law behind. Yeah? So what is the physical law behind it? And finally, linear regression is a basic building block of deep learning. Okay, so another way of um, to say what deep learning is: deep learning is stacking lots of linear regression on top of each other. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, I'm exaggerating. So there are some more things. There are some linearities, but the basic building block is something like linear regression. So it's very important to really fully understand it, what it's doing, yeah, and how it works. So far, so good. So now, how do we do this regression thing? So we assume some model for our function. Yeah? So we, for example, let's say we have a scalar x, and we could say my function should be linear in x. So I have two parameters here, w0 and w1. Okay? And I learn a function f of x, which has this form where I now can choose a w0 and a w1. However, I could also learn a nonlinear function, for example, a parabola, which is this one. Then I have three parameters. Or I could have even more parameters, okay, which is an even more complicated polynomial here. Um, again, it is called linear regression because it's linear in the parameter. So also these functions that I'm learning here are nonlinear, yeah, but it's linear in the parameter, so it's called linear regression. Okay, I think I said it already three times. Five more to go. Okay, um, how am I doing this? I'm doing this by fitting my model yeah, using least squares. Yeah, so I'm trying to minimize these squared errors between my assumption here. So that was my model assumption that I'm having this um, inner product between my, so the w now contains w0, w1, w2. And the xi could be a vector where I'm having the, the 1, the x to the power of 1, the x to the power of 2, the x to the power of 3 in there. Okay, And I'm trying to minimize these squared distances between my measurements and um, my modeled function, which is ideally more, more smooth. And I average over all data points, and I'm looking for the argmin. The question, of course, now is, why, am, why are we using least squares, right? So why don't we take the L1 norm? So what assumptions are behind least squares? And we've seen last time already that the basic assumption here is that there's a Gaussian distribution somewhere hidden. So basically, the distribution of these errors here, we assume that it's a Gaussian distribution. Okay? And then 
if we minimize or maximize the likelihood with the Gaussian distribution, we end up with least square. And we go through that again today, but in principle it's the same that we've seen already. So here comes the, the old reference from Carl Friedrich Gauss. Um, and let me say, there were like in, in the, in the yeah, two centuries ago, like the Germans were writing lots of papers and the French people were also writing lots of papers. And sometimes, like in complex analysis, I think there was Weierstrass on the German side and Cauchy on the French side. Both have their own definition of what is a holomorphic function, right? And at the end, both definitions are equivalent, right? How nice is that, right? So both schools kind of come up with their own definitions to define what is how to define differentiable complex functions. Both come up with the same thing. Similarly here, um, Legendre was working, of course, on the orbite des comets, yeah, which is astronomic, nice applied subject for a mathematician. And he also tries to find out nouvelle methods, or methods, I'm bad at French, um, to find out the, the orbits of comets, okay? Again, if you find a formula which can predict, yeah, which can extrapolate where the comets are or where some Ceres moon is appearing tomorrow or maybe next week or maybe next month, like then you really have understood the physics behind it, right? If you can derive an equation which describes it. So this is really a very interesting piece of science. And um, I think in that time you would say they, they were as fast, they were at the, same, at the same time developing the same kind of methods, okay? So I think Legendre didn't have his paper on archive, so Gauss maybe didn't knew about it, but maybe he knew, I don't know, but yeah, so maybe they have slight differences. Anyway, in this book, Theoria Motus Corporem Celestium, so those are the, the celestial bodies yeah, on the sky, um, basically in this book he derives the method of least squares and he basically derives the method of maximum likelihood and he invents the normal distribution over here, okay? Uh, let's have a look at the book just for fun, okay? I don't know whether you like this, Things it, I have fun with it. So let's see whether I have it. Oh yeah, it's over here. So today you can download all these old papers, yeah, or all these old books, yeah? So please do, right? It's interesting to look at them and to find out. So this is a book, it's completely written in Latin. But um, of course you had Latin in school, right? Yeah, so you are the math guys. You took Latin? No, you did not. Okay, then you, maybe French, and you can read Legendre. So that would be another option. Okay, sure. So and here you see he's called Carolo Friederico Gauss. Okay. And um, I think I found the page. It's 100 something. Oh, where do I have it? Let me first look on the slides. I think I have written it down on the slides. Oh, yeah, page 212. And um, I should change. Oh, no, okay, the view is fine. Let's just look at it for fun. Okay, we are in the second part of the book. Oh. So here we go. Now, what do we get here? So you have to go through the Latin, but when you look at the formula down here, then you have some phi delta. I don't know what the phi delta thing here is, but um, then comes some other part. Um, how can I? Move this one, okay, like this. And this looks very much like the Gaussian distribution, doesn't it? So you have the delta squared. The delta is the difference between the mean and your var variable. And then you have, like, you multiply it with h squared. The h squared is the precision, yeah? So it's not the standard deviation, but the inverse standard deviation, okay? And so it's h squared and the minus sign. So e to the minus the delta, so the difference, divided by sigma squared. And in front of it, you multiply with the precision, like, in a, like we write it down, that you divide by the standard deviation, so here you multiply with the precision, and divide by the square root of pi, okay? He knew it all already, so he derived it here. And um, when you go on, there's also a more complicated version, so this one is the multivariate version. So here you see the standard deviation to the power of mu, where mu is the number of parameters, and then pi also to the pi of minus. I would read this as a half times mu. It looks a little bit like a tau, but I don't know. It should, I think, one half times mu. And then e to the, again, precision squared. 
And now this is now the sum of several distances, okay? So it's a multivariate distribution. Okay, and now when you, when you translate this, um, the this, this sentence here, this systema itaque blah blah blah, so my Latin is very rusty, but um, we can read this one, so you maximize some probability here, okay, some probability value, um, that is the same as um, minimization, so here's the minimum, yeah, minimizing the quadratic differences of these things. Okay, so that is the least square piece here, yeah? Which is pretty cool, I think. Um, so I copied those one also out, and you can put them into Google Translate, and it will translate it for you. And it will be the description of the least square method. I didn't check the Legendre paper, though, so it should be interesting to look at that one as well. Anyway, this is just nice to see how these things come, right? So they are not there yet, and then researchers trying to figure something new out. People were using the mean for many calculations, and Gauss wanted to know, so for the mean, so what is the most natural dis probability distribution? And he came up with the Gaussian distribution, so the parameter is the mean. So if people are using this method, I'm just averaging stuff, so why can you do it? So with what assumption are you doing this? And you're doing it with the assumption of having a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so that's the story behind. Where were we? Yeah, why this squares? And Gauss was already interested in the underlying assumption of doing such an averaging here. Anyway, enough history. So let's write it up now with modern notation. And as often, these things are typically difficult because the notation is weird and a bit hard. And everyone uses their own notation. In particular, sometimes on Wikipedia pages, the notation could be cumbersome, yeah, to say the least. It's typically that maybe there might be a statistician who learned about linear regression, then they start writing up the page, and then someone else comes and writing something, and so it's getting a bit complicated. Let's look at the different cases, and let's develop a simple notation that we can use. And ideally, if you see other notations, you can map it to that one, okay? So here's the simplest case. Suppose we have a single data point, and we have a linear function. So let's say my location is a vector, okay? So we're a little bit um, generally here. So we have several components, more like in this 2D example. Um, then the function value at location x is modeled just as the inner product of the coordinates with some weights, okay? So that is a linear function. And it's linear in x as well, but also linear in w. And next, our measured value is assumed to be Gaussian distributed around this true value. So this true value is like the straight line, or some could be a curved line, but in this case it's a straight line. And around that one, with a certain noise, yeah, we will do some measurement. And that can be modeled as the Gaussian distribution in our notation here. And note that this one is univariate, okay, because we have only a single data point. Sigma squared is the variance of our measurement noise. Typically, it's not important so much that we know the sigma square, only when we want to do weighted least square or something like that. Um, the value y is a scalar at the end because the inner product is calculating that one. Yeah, I don't know why the screens are switching on and off. If we find a solution for that one, that would be awesome. I don't know. I have no idea. Sorry about that. Here the parameter w is unknown, okay? So the x is known and the y is known, but the w is unknown. So the w is not a direct parameter of my Gaussian distribution, but we can use this parameter to calculate the mean. And then we basically have a probability distribution here. Parameter sigma squared is typically assumed to be known in this case, so we don't want to estimate it, okay? And again, the whole thing is called linear regression because my function f is linear in w. Let's look at the more general point of view. Now we have, yes, question? Yeah, that is the scalar, exactly, yes. So the measured value y is a scalar. It must have the same dimensionality as the y. Very right, very correct. Okay, again, um, let's say we are talking about a linear function, but now we have several data points, yeah? So we have several vectors x1 to xn, several observations. Now there's the question, how do we put it into a matrix? We could put the x1 to xn as columns into a matrix, Sometimes we do that when we do PCA, yeah, then we do it along, 
we do columns for the vectors, but for linear regression, it's more common to put the data points as rows into the matrix. Yeah, and you just have to be careful. The reason why we put rows here is that is the more common notation in linear regression papers or in linear regression Wikipedia entries. But it's arbitrary. You could, of course, also put it into columns. You just need to be careful. Yeah? So the nice thing is if my x's are rows, I can now just write my, before was it x transpose w, I can just write as x times w. Because this will multiply each row with the w. Okay, if I say my location matrix contains column vectors, I would have capital X transpose times W because I first have to flip it. But it's nicer like that for our formulas because the X will be like uh, we take the X transpose times X inverse times X transpose times something. So it gets confusing if we do it the other way around. The formulas just don't look so nice anymore. Okay, now the measured value, yeah, y's are Gaussian distributed around our xw. Okay, so far so good. So the reason why I talked about a single data point is so that you see already the structure of all of this and the y was a scalar, but now the y is a vector. Yeah, and each entry in the vector y corresponds to one of the measurements. And here you see why it might be nice to have the x as rows because then you have basically a big table, okay? So let me draw it once. So you have a big table where the first part of the table is the x and the last part is the y, the last column, okay? And then you have your data points numbered from 1 to n. And so each row is basically one measurement, like an Excel sheet, okay? So you have an Excel sheet and like the first columns are my x, and the last column is my y, for example. Okay, that's why it's nice. So because in the y vector, um, if we would take the x transpose, we should also use the row vector for the y, but then that's also not so nice. So that's why it's nice to have the locations as rows in my x, because the y is then a nice column vector. And then the y is just Gaussian distributed around this mean x times w. Again, so let's make it more specific. So let's say we have D columns, okay. What does it tell us about W? So how many entries in W do I have? Is it a, is the question too easy or too difficult? Yes? I think D plus one. Ah, D plus one is one possibility. Uh, let's check it. So I want to calculate D X times W. And X is an N by D matrix. So the W is better a D vector only. Okay, so it's a D by one vector. Okay? So I have as many entries in the W as I have columns in my X. This one is an extra column here. It's an extra one that I don't use. And then this result will be compared then later with my vector Y. Okay? And you see already, wow, this notation is kind of nice, right? So now I'm, I'm having a whole vector of arrows and of that one I can take the L2 norm, for example. And that's another way to write down summation over all entries. And I could also do it for each of them. So I would take the, now let's use some Python notation. I, I want to take the i's row, which is i colon, okay, times w. And that one squared. Or if I say, okay, my um, entries in my matrix, they are all called here xi transpose. So vectors are column vectors, so those are row vectors now. xi transpose is one of these. I could also say um, this is now a shortcut notation for this summation over there, okay? And there you see, like, typically, this is how you think about it. You have single data point and you're calculating the squared error, and you're averaging over all of them, okay? You can also say 1 divided by n. And you see, you can drag in the summation also into this and get rid of all the indices when you have the notation right, okay? Even further, also the um, L2 norm could be written 
to say I'm taking the vector, transpose it, and multiply it with itself. Okay, so that's yet another way to write things up. Oh, okay, very bad. Hmm, how am I do this? I never write at this location again. Okay, let me mark it that I'm not using that one. Okay, sorry. So, this is the usual way to think about it. You look at single data points and you want to minimize the error for each of the data points. However, using our matrix notation, some linear algebra from MAFI 1, yeah, you can have a very shortcut notation for that one. In particular, this almost looks like some code that you could implement very easily, like in NumPy or something, okay? And you don't have for loops anymore, right? The summation is a for loop. Here you don't have a for loop. So it's hidden in the BLAST library, in some super fast linear algebra library, okay? Good, so this, just as an aside, that's why this x having as these rows is kind of nice here in this context of linear regression. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Now y is a vector, yeah, and it contains for each of the x i a scalar value, yeah, and again, x times w is linear in w, so this is called linear regression. I also said it's not always about finding straight lines, so it's not always about linear functions, it's also sometimes about nonlinear functions. So now how do we get to nonlinear functions? Okay. So what we could do is let's start with a scalar valued x. Let's keep it simple. Yeah? Our x is now just a real number. And what we could do now, we can have these basis functions which turn a single scalar into a vector. Yeah? So here we are turning it into a column vector where the first entry is 1, the next one is the scalar to the power of 1, the next one is the scalar to the power of 2, up to the scalar to the power of d. Okay, what happens if I multiply it with my w here? So it's a column vector, I need to transpose it to make it a row vector. Basically what I'm getting here is a polynomial of degree d. Okay, so that's exactly what I'm getting. So now this phi of x transpose times w is a very nice notation to write such a polynomial. And um, of course we could have it more general, but it gets more messy. So let's say our x is a vector. So we could also define a polynomial basis function for vectors. Yeah? So here's an example. I'm now calling the entries a and b. Of course, I, maybe on previous versions of these slides, I had called them x sub 1 and x sub 2, which are typically the entries of a vector. But in this case, x sub 1 and x sub 2 are different data points, which are vectors themselves, right? So for that reason, I'm calling them just a and b, because they're only appearing here, the entries of a vector. And then my basis function would, again, calculate a 1, an a, and b, an a squared, a b squared, but also mixed terms, a times b, and so on and so forth. In general, basically, I would say I'm having a polynomial of degree d, yeah, if I'm allowing exponents to go up to d. But I'm saying the sum of the exponents must go up to d. So I'm not allowed to say a squared times b squared if my d is equal to 2, for example. That's written down here, okay? So polynomials up to degree d could be written like that. I have some parameters, w, i, j, a to i, b to j, Okay, where the sum of i plus j is less than or equal to d. And you can imagine if I have a three-dimensional vector, the whole thing gets even more messy. And of course, you can write it out, but here we have three things that we want to put on an x. We want to count the data points, and we do that by the right sub-index. Then we want to have exponents, we do it on the right super-index. Yeah, those are the exponents that we typically use here. And then we also want to talk about the entries in a vector. And since all, all, all exponents and subindices are gone, we just give it two different letters. However, we only want to talk about it on this slide and then never again. Yeah? So we need all these three only at the same time. So in general, you could imagine that, OK, this is a version for the scalar entries, for scalar inputs. This is a version for uh, an in input with having a two-dimensional vector. 
And in principle now, I think you could have enough fantasy to come up with a phi which would also be three-dimensional or even higher dimensional, okay? Just putting in all these so-called monomials. These entries are called monomials, these products, okay? However, we won't do it explicitly, right? Because we only need to understand that it's possible, but then we want to have a nice notation when we derive the um, solution for the least square. Okay, so somehow this phi can map a vector x that can be arbitrary dimensional onto some other vector phi of x, which might be much higher dimensional. Yeah? So for example, here the starting point x is two-dimensional, and if we take all monomials up to degree two, we will have one, two, three, four, five, six entries. Yeah? And if we would take all monomials up to degree three, we will have many more. And it's, I'm not sure whether it's exponentially growing, but it's growing very fast the number of entries we would have, okay? So these basis function ex expansion is also a preview to support vector machines. So that's the same trick that we will use in support vector machines. Yeah? And then we will also get rid of all these complicated ways to write down things by using the kernel trick. But this is in a different lecture later on, okay? So here we just use it to have a sophisticated linear regression where we are able to learn also parabolas or even more complicated functions. Okay, um, these entries in this uh, phi of x are also sometimes called features. Okay, so this thing is kind of generating features from my raw data. Yeah? So this is just, sometimes you read that they are called features. Again, my function now is called phi x transpose. Yeah, it's a vector that I need to transpose times w, where w now is large enough, it is as large as this vector is long, okay? However, it's still linear in W, and so the whole thing is called linear regression. But it is now nonlinear in X, okay? By the way, why do I care so much for, for yelling at you that the W is linear appearing here? If it's linear appearing here and we want to optimize over it, of course, derivative is super simple, optimization is super simple. You can even write down a closed form solution for the W. You cannot do that for the X because the x possibly appears here nonlinearly in here, okay? So that's why in linear regression it's so important that it's linear in the parameters. Okay, so now this was a ex little excursion to basis function expansion. Now you know what's possible. Now suppose we have a single data point, yeah? Then my function could be modeled as phi of x transpose times w. Now this is a more complicated way to model my functions. Let's see. What about our measurements? The measurements are still Gaussian, um, so or everything stays the same. Only the mean change over here, okay? So, and in this case, if I have a single data point, the y is again a scalar. The x might be a vector, and the phi of x is a vector, and the w must be a very long vector, possibly, okay? So let's look at multiple data points. Then we need to extend our notation again. So now we have all these phi of x1, phi of the first data point, phi of the nth data point. And we plug all of those as rows into a big matrix which we call phi of x, okay? This is nice because then we can just plug in this phi of capital X into the Gaussian distribution and multiply it with w. And now you see, this is, is a special case of our notation that we had before. We had a capital X and we multiplied it with w. Now we have a phi of x and multiply it with w, okay? So um, the phi of x just calculated new features from my vector x, okay? So it's just a different representation of these of these. So in principle, everything that we wrote down and will write down in the rest of the lecture will hold for both. It will hold for the cases where we work directly with the x where the rows are the data points, or with the phi of x, where the rows are basis expansions. In particular, that means, since the phi of x is defined to be really just another x, in the following, we only need to talk about the x, and we can forget about the phi of x. So everything now that we derive, all the formulas, yeah, we derive them just for x times w. But, of course, you can always put a phi in front of the x and first nonlinearly preprocess your data and then you will have a nonlinear 
function for your linear regression. Okay, however, the mass is nicer if we do that. Okay, so the goal in the following will be given that we have some x and y, where the x might be actually a phi of x, yeah, estimate the parameter vector w. So that is what's happening next. However, we could have written down everything also with the phi of x or with an even worse notation, yeah, always having finite sums and all of this. And in some books, you see this. However, it's much easier to use this notation. And then everything gets really simple. Okay? So far, so good. As you see, we spend lots of time with notation. But by doing that, we will cover many cases in parallel. right? So we will cover scalar inputs. We cover vector-valued inputs. And we cover the case where we have a nonlinear feature extractor that is generate, transforming our input vector into a much larger vector. And the cases all can be covered with talking about x times w. Okay. On the Wikipedia page, these things, I think, are called scalar linear regression or multiple linear regression. And there's also some generalized version of linear regression. And they are all covered here on this framework. OK. Last time, so why is linear regression called linear? So we have a, b, and c, and d. Because it's linear in the features, first possibility. Because it's linear in the parameters. Because it honors Francois Philippe Marquis de Linear. I don't know whether you find it funny. I find it funny. Or because it sounds more scientific than just regression, right? And of course, by now, if you didn't sleep, you know the true answer is b. OK? So that's it. And the slides are gone again. What do I have to do? Press the mouse button, maybe. OK. So OK, this is the very last time. So now, how do we estimate now the weights w? We haven't talked at all about that one. We only talked about notation yeah, and about what the notation buys us in how to model an interesting function f. So let's see how we can estimate it. Of course, what we now do is maximum likelihood estimation. That's like the first thing to try. So for maximum likelihood estimation, when you look at books, often it's written down like this. So you have some data, d, and some probability distribution over this data that is conditioned on a parameter. And you maximize it with respect to this parameter. Sometimes people put a semicolon because for some people the w is not a random variable. I'm having here my Bayesian hat on, and for me the w is a random variable, so I put a bar. OK? So that's fine. Um, the D thing is now a notation that I don't like very much. And I only show it you on this slide because it, I think it appears in the book. Yeah? But I show you why I don't like it, and we will go on slightly differently. So the D is now some data set, which is basically containing these pairs of x and y. Yeah? Um, and it's IID data, meaning IID means stands for independent identically distributed. OK? That basically means um, the, single, the first data point has the same distribution as the last data point. In principle, this requires that we have a distribution for the x and for the y. And when we sample from the x, we can calculate the function value and add some noise. OK? And that is generating my data point. Um, independent means that um, yeah, these values over here, they don't influence the outcome of the following ones. It's like throwing a coin. Yeah, if I throw a coin 10 times, then the sequence of heads and tails is also an IID data set. Because like, the first throw does not influence the outcomes of the other. Um, the identically distributed independence means that my likelihood will factorize. So in principle, I have a joint distribution on many, many things here, on x1, y1, to yxn, to x, uh, yn. But I can split it up into these different pieces, so into these different data points. Okay, So my joint distribution is factorizing into the different pieces. And here now is where the notation becomes a bit fishy, because now suddenly the x is on the right-hand side of the bar. And that's why I don't like the notation with the data set on the left-hand side. Yeah? It is OK yeah, if we assume that the D only contains the values. But often it's written that the data set contains the x and the values. But when you look on the right-hand side, yeah, it's a bit strange. The x appears on the right-hand side. So there's a little bit of a mix-up. Yeah? 
What we will write is, we will always write the likelihood like that. We will say p of y given x and w. Of course, what does it mean if the x appears only on the right hand side of the bar? It means that we are not modeling p of x. Okay, the distribution of x is not modeled at all. We only model the function. Yeah? We only model, given an x, how do you calculate a y? But how you, how you get your x's or how you sample them, we don't put it into the model. And that's very typical for linear regression. You only model the function, only the functional relationship going from x to y, but not the x itself. Um, since we have uh, all these tools now, uh, we could also say so the joint distribution would be x and y and by using our product rule we can split it into the distribution of x times the distribution of y given x and in linear regression we don't care for the p of x so why worry about it? we don't we only worry about given an x how can we get a y? What is the right distribution here? Okay? So that is what we are doing in regression. Okay, so far so good. So on the following, I will always write p of y given x and w, and I'm never using this notation. And if I'm using it, I should correct it. But when you look into books, often you see this data set here appearing on the left-hand side. Anyway, yet another little detail. Let's go on with the math here. So we want to maximize the likelihood we can also maximize the log likelihood because the logarithm is a monotonically increasing function. That's fine. And the typical notation is to use this curly L over here. Okay, so this curly L thing, thingy, that is often the notation for the log likelihood. So um, the likelihood was about IID data, so it's factorizing, and the logarithm of a product is the summation of the logarithm of the um, factors. Okay, so that's why we get this summation over the logarithm of this product. Now plugging in our assumption yeah, that it's a Gaussian distribution, yeah, so that my um, measurements basically have Gaussian noise on top of them. Again, I said in a different lecture already, that's a very good assumption to do because it's compatible with the central limit theorem, that if there are many things like in my cheap spectrometer that I bought at a, some online shop. Um, if there are many things, for example, some screws are not so tight, maybe there's a toler the tolerance is very bad with the tubing and something. So there are many errors in my machine and they all sum up and lead to my measurement error. So it's reasonable to say they are Gaussian distributed. And the other story is, I don't want to assume anything about my um, error, I want to have the maximum entropy distribution and that is the Gaussian as well. So both stories kind of lead us to the Gaussian distribution. Okay, if I plug everything in and take the logarithm, I end up with the summation of the least squares and we had a similar distribution or uh, similar derivation already before and some, some other constant factor over here. Uh, now using our clever matrix notation, we can also rewrite it as I derived on the, black, on the blackboard, okay? Which is more convenient. So every for loop that you can get rid of makes the math easier and nicer, yeah? So writing sub-indices is always not so nice. You should always try to vectorize it. That's also how we would want to implement it in a script language like Python. Okay, so the mean squared error is also sometimes called sum of squared error or L2 norm of the residual error. So the residuals are basically the error, so the, the stuff that I cannot explain with my current estimate of w, so the, the things that I'm still wrong with my measurements, those are called the residuals, and um, that's why there are some different names in different branches of science. Um, so we see that maximum likelihood estimation, assuming a Gaussian likelihood, will lead to a, the method of least squares. Okay, so far so good. Um, oh, that's just a repetition. Uh, another way to say it, if we have Gaussian distributed measurements, then least square is a well justified method. Of course, practically another way to justify <coughs> excuse me, least squares is, is computationally nice, right? So it's like one step away from a linear function and it's like a smooth function that is differentiably everywhere. And for squared functions, when we minimize them, we typically can derive 
closed form solution. So that's the other reason why people like it, right? So it's mathematically nice. Oh, here's another reference to Gauss' book from 1809. Uh, that he started to use the mean, or people are using the mean because it was in established, and he was thinking about finding the right distribution so that if he's looking for the most probable numbers on the sky, yeah, what distribution should he use for these probabilities so that at the end he can use the mean that everyone is using anyway. Okay? So by that he's kind of extending the knowledge about why are we using the mean of something. We are using it because we are assuming a certain distribution. Great. Uh, I need a reference for this statement. I wrote it, I copied it from somewhere, but I forgot it. So if you find it, um, please tell me. I will put it into the slides. OK, so let's rewrite it again. So this is our log likelihood. And if we put the arc marks in front, we can get rid of most of the terms. Right? If it's the arc marks, we can get rid of a constant term. We don't care for the functional value. We only interested in the w that will maximize this. And also a constant uh, uh, scaling factor also is super irrelevant. And now if you multiply this out, yeah, y transpose times y doesn't contain a w, I can omit it. And then I have a minus xw transpose times an xw. That is now my first term over here. And I will have two mixed terms where I have y times x times w, OK? And I have two of them. Now you might wonder, yes, you have two of them, but they look different, don't they? Ah, they do look different a little bit when you write them down. So one of them looks like this. And the other one looks like the transposed version of that one. And I replaced it with two times w transpose x transpose y. Any idea why this is allowed? Anyone knows it? Why can I do this? It's a common trick. Any ideas? Is your linear algebra a bit rusty? Maybe. So let me get my sponge and I show you my reasoning, OK? So it works like this. Let's draw the pictures. Let's draw the, the, the stick figures. So this is my W. Then I have some matrix uh, which might contain N. Yeah? So I have N here and D over there. And then I have a vector Y which has the same length as that one. So it's N times 1. OK, so what does it mean? And I even write equations. If I multiply a row vector times a matrix times a column vector, what do I get? I get the outer dimensions and the outer dimensions, so the inner dimensions get summed over, this inner dimension gets summed over, and I get the one by one, which is just a point. Great. And for the same reasoning, this is also just a point, but the other way around. I have first the short vector, so I first have the one times d, then I have the x transpose, which looks like d times n, and I have the n times one. Again, inner dimensions get summed out. Outer dimensions are 1, so I have a point. And the point, there's a nice rule for the point. So if I have a point and you transpose it, you get the same thing. OK? Or I can also, let's put a letter in here. Let's say I have an alpha. An alpha is typically a scalar. Yeah? So a scalar transpose is, again, this one. Great. So I know this thing is a scalar. OK? If it's a scalar, I can transpose it, right? Nothing changes. Let's use the, ro the rules for transposing. Um, so let's first, or let's, OK, let me copy that one. Plus now the result of this one. The ordering of all terms changes, and all terms need to be transposed. So the y comes first now and it gets a transpose sign. Then next one is the x is already transposed. Transpose, it is the x again. The w transpose, transpose is the w, which is the same. OK? So these are simple calculations yeah, that you should do yourself. When you write down things in this notation, it's often useful to make these drawings so that you don't have a type error. Okay? 
So that um, also the code would yell at you if you if the things don't match properly. That's why I, I can just do this one. Okay. Okay. So far so good. So I simplified it even further. Yeah. And now comes the miracle. Now I have to take the derivative of this function with respect to w, which is a bit scary because w is a vector, right? So how do you take derivative with respect to vectors? We will see next time, on Monday, we will do matrix differential calculus. And there I show you how to take derivative with respect to vectors and matrices and stuff, because it's, it's fun and it's super useful for here. Um, I don't derive it now, but um, when you look at a special case, let's say the w is a scalar, yeah, then this is basically w squared times some number. And this is 2 times w. Um, if you um, take the derivative, yeah, you will get the w squared. The derivative will be 2 times w minus the constant. And if you bring it to the other side, you will get exactly this formula. Okay? Try it. Put the, replace the x with a scalar, the w with a scalar, and the y with a scalar, and then calculate the derivative and plug everything in here, and you will get the same solution. Okay? However, you can also do it with matrices. And you can also calculate the derivative of this thing with matrices. And when you do it and set it to 0 and isolate the w, then you get exactly this formula. So next time, we will do the proper derivation when we have the tools from matrix differential calculus. Yeah? Um, let's for now accept it just as the solution for the maximum likelihood estimation. That is a typical formula that you see in textbooks on linear regression. Yeah? So this is linear regression. You just take your data set, transpose it times y, you transpose it multiplied with itself, inverse matrix, and there you go. That's it. So now, why didn't I put the x? Uh, why was my matrix x not the columns of my data points exactly for this formula? So this formula would look really ugly if everything would have to be transposed. OK, not really ugly, but this, it just didn't look uh, so recognizable. So it would look like this. It would be x times x transpose inverse x times y. And that's not the formula that you remember for linear regression, but it's the other formula that you remember for linear regression. Okay, So that's why I use this notation. So what we just derived is also called ordinary least squares. Yeah? And here is how to derive it. We will do it next time. So far, so good. Now, how, OK, just a second. How do you do linear regression? You take your Excel sheet, yeah, your columns. You need to find out what is my x and what is my y. And then you just, you, ideally, you export it to Python. And then you plug it into this formula, and you get your w. Okay? And if you are advent, advantageous, adventurous, something, you first put your x into a fire of x. Okay? So you can also first transform it. And I don't care with which program you can. You can also do it with Excel and generate more columns in some clever way. And then you run this formula. Question? Oh, very true. This is all wrong. Very bad. OK, so you're very right. So this is arc max, yes? And this should be arc min. Thank you very much. So that is very true. Should I change it now? I th think it's very bad to do this during the lecture, but I always enjoy it. So let's do it now. It's, it's very quick does not exist. Oh, I'm in the wrong folder. OK, very quickly, I'm fast with this one. There's the argmax. <laughs> and this must be the argmin. And this must be the argmin. OK. <clears throat> Thank you very much. No, it should, are there some other? no, that one is right. So that's the argmax. OK, so you can do certain things under the argmax, but you are not allowed to multiply with minus 1. When you multiply with minus 1, the argmax becomes an argmin. 
Okay. Good. Let's look at a simple example here. So this is like a simple demo, which maybe it's also from the book. No, I think this one I did myself. So here's a data set, so some data points. And the data points are always the same in these three examples. I just changed my function that I'm fitting here. So here I'm fitting a polynomial of degree 1, here's a polynomial of degree 2, and here's a polynomial of degree 10. Okay? And I'm just running it through this formula that we've just seen. And so here you get a nice straight line, which somewhat makes sense. Here you get a parabola, which makes even more sense to our visual look. And here you get something which is going nicely through the data points, but it's probably a bit overdoing it. And those are three classical situations in statistics. So this looks just right, and this is so-called underfitting, which means that my model class is too simple. I'm only looking for straight lines, but my data actually is nonlinear. Okay, so this is called underfitting. This is called overfitting. So here I'm taking the data too seriously. So there, I know there's measurement noise on them, so I shouldn't really go through each of them, even if I could. If I would increase the d equal 10 to d equal 20, I even could go through all of the data points. Okay? And this is called overfitting. And the question is how to get just to this position over here. And as a preview, we will talk about it in more detail, but as a preview, what you could do is you could take some, um, so to avoid the overfitting, you could take some test data point yeah, and try your solution on the test data point and calculate the, basically the probability or the least square fit. Yeah? And then it would tell you, yes, um, the errors for this very wiggly curve is on unseen data that hasn't been used by the algorithm, not so good as in this example. Okay? Good, so there are now some interesting things already to see. Okay, let's, let's move on. There's another fancy way of doing regression, which is called rich regression. And so one thing, another way to avoid this overfitting situation is to say, okay, my Ws now, when you look at them, they get really large to go through all these data points here. Yeah? So the coefficients Wi are really large numbers. And now um, an interesting solution is, um, how about if I drag them towards the origin? So I'm actually saying um, my weights should be smaller. Yeah? Then this is, even though I'm very flexible, this is dragging me to smoother solutions, which are not so wiggly. So having smaller W entries in a 10-dimensional regression thing will lead to smoother solutions that more look like a parabola or a to the power of 3 function. Okay? And this is called regularization, um, this, uh, this, this trick that we are kind of pushing the weights towards zero. However, being Bayesian, we could also write it out like this. We say, let's say we have a prior distribution for my W, which is centered around zero with some additional variance for the um, parameter here, okay? And then we do map estimation. Okay, let's do that. So map estimation basically means I'm maximizing now my posterior distribution. Um, let's write it out with Bayesian, this base rule. I can get rid of the evidence here because it doesn't contain the W. So under the arc marks, I can just remove it. And it has not a negative sign, so I can really just remove it. And then if I plug everything in, I'm getting here the logarithm of the... F I can apply the logarithm as well, by the way, because it's a monotonic function, monotonically increasing function. And so I get the summation of the first term and the logarithm of the second term, okay, of two Gaussian distributions. And if I go through the mass, yeah, I will first get a least square term over here. That one is basically measuring the fit, so the likelihood makes sure that I'm going th closely through my data and I get a second term, which is often called the regularizer, and that is now just the L2 norm of the W. Okay? And so what we just did is, we kind of found a justification for using um, such a regularization here in um, linear regression. And so rich regression, what they're doing is basically they are um, adding this, having this additional term here. And not only minimizing the fit, but also saying, okay, we want to have a good fit, but at the same time a small w. However, it comes at a cost. The w now needs some hyperparameter lambda, which is new here. 
Yeah, one can derive that the hyperparameter is just the ratio between sigma squared and tau squared. Yeah? So it's a ratio between something that we might know and something that, yeah, which is parameter of, your, of our prior, which is very arbitrary, kind of, right? And um, it turns out that is a parameter that we can tweak somehow. And it's unclear what the trade-off should be. Of course, if my parameter lambda is very, very small, it's like doing typical maximum likelihood. Yeah? So it's, I will get a very wiggly solution. If I make my parameter lambda larger, then I want to have a solution with a small w, and I get a smoother solution, yeah? possibly even at the end a very linear solution, it can, or even a constant function. Yeah? So the parameter lambda now can kind of tune me into the right ballpark here, so what might be the right one, even though I'm using 10 parameters. OK, um, if I do the minimization of z1 over here, again, calculating the derivative with respect to w, setting it to 0, and solving for w, I get a formula which looks very much like the one that I had, but now I have a lambda times identity matrix plus this x transpose x. And this is a formula for rich regression. Okay, so when you see on the Wikipedia page on linear regression, the part on rich regression, you know, okay, that's just map estimation with the Gaussian prior on the parameter. That's just the same thing. I hope by now you also appreciate that we went through the pain of introducing all this probabilistic stuff at the beginning, because then suddenly methods become really easy to, to put into your big Zetskasten, I don't know what it's called, into one of the boxes. So this is map estimation. OK, I know what map estimation is, and I could also imagine other variations, right? So why not replace the prior for the W with a different prior, yeah? for example, with the Laplace distribution? And then I'm suddenly having here an L1 prior, which is the lasso, yeah, which is yet another algorithm. Okay, so it's nice to look on all, at all these methods through the probabilistic lens. Here's a different story for the regularizer: why people like it in optimization. It's making the inverse matrix here more stable. Yeah. So basically, what we're doing here, when you add these two matrices by adding the identity matrix, what you're doing it you are increasing the size of the eigenvalues of this matrix. Yeah? Why are the eigenvalues relevant? Because the inverse matrix will have 1 divided by all these eigenvalues. So if the x transpose x has a very small eigenvalue, let's say 10 to the minus 14, yeah? when you take the inverse matrix, you will get here a gigantically ma gigantic matrix and the whole thing can explode and everything get, can get really large or as in mathematical optimization, you would say numerically unstable. Yeah? So that's why people regularize to make this inversion numerically more stable. So you see there are many reasons why people use least square, it's convenient, blah, 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 but we can derive it from the Gaussian distribution. How nice is that? Then there are many people using regularization. However, we can also derive it from our Bayesian point of view, which is really nice, I think. Okay, so one way to say is it's making the optimization, the inverse inversion here, more numerically stable. Another way to say is, oh, it's the same as now assuming something about my w, okay? So I like that very much. Anyway, so let's go on. Um, so this is what I just said, so let's skip this slide. Um, now the question was, there are two options now to go from the more complicated solutions to the simpler ones. One is, by adjusting the lambda, yeah, we can get more smooth solutions. The other one was by changing the d, which was basically is a parameter of my basis function, phi. Okay? So I don't have a complete answer, but towards an answer, so the d parameter sets the model complexity, yeah, from linear to, poly, uh, to, to uh, parabolas to higher degree polynomials. So I'm fixing that one, and the lambda is related to the signal-to-noise ratio. Yeah? Why is that? Because the lambda was the ratio of sigma square, which is the noise, amount of noise, divided by the tau square, which was the variance of my prior. And the prior is basically saying, how much do I think already that I know the solution? Yeah? If my tau is very large, then I say I basically want to trust my data and not so much 
like some any preconception, but if I make my tau very small, then I say my data has to fight a lot to move me away from my zero. Yeah? And so the lambda is a parameter which is kind of telling me something about how, how clean is my signal. Yeah? So how much should I trust my signal? So it can be regularized with the lambda. Okay, so here it says next slide, but it's, oh yeah, it will come on the next slide. Why this is a signal to noise ratio. Okay, I will explain it. But before we do that, let's talk about Bayesian linear regression now. So we were Bayesian so far, but we only did point estimates. Yeah, point estimates meaning we calculate a particular W. But what if we say our answer should be a posterior distribution over the W? What can we do? Ideally, everything is Gaussian. In this case, it is. So my prior for the W is a Gaussian distribution. My measurements are Gaussian. So my posteriors are also Gaussian. And these somewhat complicated looking formulas are just variations of the stuff that we learned in the lecture on Gaussian distributions. Okay? So this is just the posterior distribution of a Gaussian. Yeah? And it is a Gaussian as well with a particular mean and a particular covariance matrix where these are the formulas that we derived elsewhere. So it can be done, which is nice. Um, now, uh, how does it compare to rich regression? Um, curiously, our posterior mean is exactly the estimator that is typically known as rich regression if we have the assumption that my covariance matrix of my measurements is the identity matrix and the covariance matrix that I'm using for the prior is also the identity matrix. So under certain assumption, yeah, so my posterior mean is exactly the rich regression. So we have an even more general point of view. So the Bayesian linear regression is deriving a posterior distribution. And if we put in more assumption, we end up with rich regression. If we put in more assumptions, where's the screen? If we put in more assumptions, we end up with the maximum likelihood solution. OK? Um, what else can we see here? We can see here the role of the lambda. So we can rewrite the, the, the Vn, so these covariance, so the posterior covariance, we can rewrite it in a clever way. And then it turns out that the lambda is equal to sigma squared divided by tau squared. And this is giving us the regularization parameter in mathematical optimization, which you need to choose like that, that it's working very well. It gives us an interpretation yeah, so that we can interpret it. Um, OK, so far so good. Any questions, by the way? You should interrupt me anyway, right? So you should not only ask questions when I'm um, asking for questions. OK, so here comes the Bayesian linear regression cartoon. Yeah, so initially, you have a prior around 0. And this is a two-dimensional problem. So we are looking for straight lines, yeah? where one parameter is now, in this case, between minus 1 and 1, and the other one is between minus 1 and 1. Or actually, it could be also minus infinity to plus infinity, so it's, so it's only plotted for that one. And that is the Gaussian distribution. That is my P of W, my prior. And now, after seeing one data point, this one over here, this will change my knowledge about my parameter W. And this is a posterior distribution. It's also a 2D Gaussian distribution in the weight space. And it's now uh, restricting basically the W0 parameter. So let's think again. What was the W0 parameter? It was W0 plus W1 times x. So the W0 is kind of the height where the function is. okay? And the W1 is the slope. Now by having a single data point now, basically the height where my function is is now limited. The slope, of course, is not limited yet. That's why it's still spread out in the w1 direction. OK. OK, next, let's see. I see a second data point. And now also the slope kind of gets more definite. And that's why basically the variance along the w1 direction is decreasing here. OK. And after seeing many, many data points, now I'm having a very specific Gaussian distribution here for the posterior. I'm having a very specific estimate at the end if I want to. So what are all these lines? So all these lines are samples from this Gaussian distribution. So from this Gaussian distribution, I can sample a W0 into W1, and I can draw the corresponding line. And I do this six times. 
And if I haven't seen any data, the lines are just all over the place. Once that I've seen like a single data point, suddenly the lines are not all over the place, but they kind of are around my data point, kind of. Okay? Once that I've seen two data points, now kind of the variance around the slope is decreasing. Yeah? And I'm, I'm seeing again different samples here. So those are samples from my posterior distribution. And once I'm very definite here, then my lines all almost look the same, okay? And they're very specific. What we are doing here is basically the same as Gaussian processes. So when we will talk about Gaussian processes, we will do linear regression again, Bayesian linear regression, and we will see very similar effects. But we'll talk about it in much more detail than now. Okay, so far so good. So this is Bayesian linear regression, and I think I've stolen this figure from Murphy's book. Yeah, it's seven one. By the way, I think from Murphy's book, he also has code for all of his figures. So you can download the code to see exactly what is he doing here if you don't understand it. Okay? Okay, so sometimes we also want to do prediction. So we are don't care for point estimates. And since we have the posterior distribution of the W, why not use it and integrate it out as well? Okay? And let's do that. Oh, again, here's the D. Okay, I didn't want to have the D anymore. But here's the D, it's really the data. So they are really the pairs. So suppose I'm having, I've seen some data x1 to xn, and now I'm at a new location x. It could be extrapolating the CO2 level in the air in 2023, okay? Or it could interpolating the temperature in whatever, Duisburg, I don't know, what is between Dortmund and Cologne. Um, so it could be any location, and I want to get the probability distribution or an estimate of that one, like at a different location. Um, Let's introduce a parameter with a summation rule. Okay, so this is using the sum rule and the product rule. And then um, the, the W only depends on w, uh, Wn and Vn. Yeah, we will draw a graphical model later in the GP, in the Gaussian process lecture for this one. But in principle, it could be split like this. And when you do the integration using some clever formulas that we had in the Gaussian distribution lecture, you can derive a Gaussian distribution for my y. And here's the wrong letter. So this should be in curly n. OK, and if you write out all these solutions, you will find out the mean will be x transpose times the posterior mean. But the, what we get additionally is now a posterior variance for our prediction as well. So maybe um, in between some of the, oh, that's the wrong window. So it's also the wrong window. So here we go. So maybe for uh, Duisburg, yeah, the estimation might be OK because we are close to Cologne. OK, so the variance might be small of my posterior predictive distribution. But for Munich over here, the variance will be very large. We also get a point estimate for the temperature over here if we did linear regression on these data points. But additionally, we have the variance. Similarly, for the climate data over here, which we measure up here, okay? So now, if we want to extrapolate into the future, okay, we get some extrapolation, but with this Bayesian approach, we get additionally some error bars, yeah, which will increase a lot the further away we are from here, okay? So this is very nice. So we are not only getting an estimate of the numbers, but we also get error bars around it. And note that the note here, the variance is location dependent. So Duisburg has a smaller variance than Munich. OK? So far, so good. Yeah, we can also write out the formulas for some special cases. And yeah, that, that's sometimes easier to have some canonical assumptions for the um, covariance matrices. OK? Good. So what we did so far was linear regression. And we assumed that our measurement is Gaussian distributed, so Gaussian noise. However, we can also have other forms of noise, of measurement noise. We could have Laplace noise. Yeah? Could be that that's the noise in my physics experiment. Um, the Laplace distribution looks like this. It's also e to the something, but with the L1 norm. And you can guess it already what it will um, be at the end. It won't be least squares, but it will be least L1 optimization. OK? And you can have many combinations. So you could combine Gaussian with Gaussians. 
Then you will end up with so-called rich regression. So that's a regularized version of regression. You can have Gaussian and Laplace distribution, where Laplace is now the prior. You get Lasso. It's a particular way of regression. You could have for the measurements Laplace and the uniform prior. Then you have the so-called robust regression. So there are many things that could be understood in this probabilistic framework here. OK? Good. So far, so good. This is the end of this section. So we are almost done. I have one minute left. So let me just quickly show you some code. OK? Um, I'm doing this typically with NumPy. Uh, this is an implementation of our function phi that I've shown you. And the, the function phi is now here taking a vector. So it's only defined for scalars. So vector meaning I having, um, let's say, five measurements that are one dimensional. Yeah? So that's why the x must be a vector. And then the output of my phi will be a matrix of features. So in this case, constant 1. And this will be x to the power of 1. And this is x to the power of 2. Okay. Then I have a model, my f of x, w. So I get the dimensionality of my um, phi function. I get it from the w. OK, that's just convenient. So I can start with a 10-dimensional w. And then that will mean that I take a 10-dimensional polynomial. OK? And this is now calculating my function f. Then given that I have a certain w, I also want to be able to sample now data. Okay, so what is this doing? This is saying I'm having an x between minus 1 and plus 1. Okay, now apply my function with some given true w and add some random noise to it. So this is now generating a data set. Okay, so this is generating samples y. Okay, so far so good. x and y. Here comes the implementation for linear regression. So it takes the data set x and y, it will pass it through my function phi and generating the capital X. And then I'm just using the usual function. However, the notation is a bit different. You might think that this is the right implementation. So you take the inverse of x transpose times x and multiply it with x transpose times y, right? However, numerically, it's more clever to use the function solve. So you are not calculating the inverse function, but you are using some clever least squares, reg some, not regression, some least squares optimization to find out the. So you are not really interested in the. Uh, let me show you on the board. So let's say you want to calculate y is equal to a inverse times x. Okay. Then a better way to do this is to minimize. Um, a times y minus x in y. So that is more clever, because then I never have to invert the matrix A. Instead, I'm optimizing a vector y that is tested with the, multiplied with the matrix A. So that might be numerically stable, and everything is fine, and you compare it to the result that you want. Okay? And maybe I wrote it in a weird way, so maybe. It should be like this. No, this is also bad. I think the typical way of writing this trick down is like that. OK, I just change the rows of x and y. OK? But actually, what you want to calculate here is x is equal to a inverse, inverse y. And to avoid this inversion here, you solve a little problem. And you can check it that it's the same result. OK, so that is linear regression. Then comes some code for the toy example. I don't show you all the details, but ideally it works. OK, here's still a little bug. Uh, the functions here are too short, so let me just redo that one. So where am I generating my x prediction? So this must be minus 1. OK. Ah, no. OK, I need to run everything. Just a second. OK, so here we go. So the starting point is the true function. Yeah? I'm getting samples from my true function. Yeah? And then I can now fit, for example, a straight line. OK, that's the fit of the straight line. I could fit a polynomial. Very nice fit. But I can also fit 
more complicated functions. In particular, I can also fit a polynomial of degree 10. Okay, and this is now trying to more go through the points. Okay, and this is just using, implementing what we learned today. It's all using this function here that we had here. What else can you do? There's this famous, I'm going over time again, sorry. Um, I'm almost done. So here's the famous Ascombi's quartet, which is just showing you that linear regression with a linear function might not be always such a great idea. So let's look at the pictures. So those are four data sets. Yeah, so this is one data set. This is another one. This is another one. And this is yet another one. And they all have exactly the same straight line. Yeah? So you can see that you should always visualize uh, your data because then you would see here, okay, this data does not look at all like this function, but there's an outlier, and that is creating the slope. Similarly here, there's an outlier that is creating a very wrong slope. So this is very non-robust. Or even here I'm having a polynomial, but fitting a, a straight line is, is giving me the same result. I think even the p-values for this linear regression thing, which we didn't talk ab at, at all about, yeah, they are all the same, and they are all like very well these, very good these fits. Finally, here's the code for you to play around with for the Bayesian linear regression to create these kind of plots. Okay, okay, that's it for today. Um, thanks a lot, and I see you on next Monday. Bye bye. <laughs>